Are you a Gen 1-er? Do you think Pokemon peaked with their first roster? The 151 monsters became quite the cultural icons, and the Pokemon company knows. Today I'll tell you about Pokemon's growth throughout the years purely in the perspective of how they treated their original designs. Do you stick to them to bolster your current fans, or do you branch out into new designs to garner a wider audience? You can call me an artist, and I've been working on my own creature collector based off of science topics, and I was curious what path the titan of the monster catching genre took throughout the years. So let's check out how the original 151 Pokemon changed over time. Alright, here's a brief overview of Pokemon's beginnings. Game Freak was a gaming magazine by Satoshi Tajiri and Ken Sugimori, who later found connections like composer Junichi Masuda to start their own development studio of the same name in 1989. The concept of pocket monsters came from Tajiri catching bugs as a child, and he thought this concept would creatively use the recently announced link cable technology for the Nintendo Game Boy. But he didn't want them just for battling, but also for people to trade creatures with each other. That's why they later made two versions of the game, with some designs being exclusive to certain versions. There were some powerful connections like Tsunekazu Ishihara, who already worked at a Nintendo-founded corporation, and also coincidentally had a similar idea of, quote, using the Game Boy like an insect cage. The concepts were merged and greenlit by Nintendo, but the development lagged on. By the way, Ishihara would later become the CEO of Creatures Inc., which co-owns Pokemon and looks over the trading card game and toys, although he stepped down earlier this year. As Game Freak will work on other games like Mario and Wario and Pulse Man, production of Pokemon was on and off as the team continued to grow. During this time, Ken Sugimori, who would later be Pokemon's art director, made concept art for the game with dinosaur-like monsters. Eventually, the game would have monsters that grow into different designs, much like how some insects go under metamorphosis to achieve different stages. When Pokemon was translated to English, this was called evolution, despite being very different from biological evolution. Of the eventual 151 designs of the first roster, there would be about 80 unique families or lines of evolutions. While there were a lot of kaiju fans amongst the staff, cute designs like Pikachu and the starter Pokemon would only be possible due to designer Atsuko Nishida. And this greatly widened the potential audience of the game by not just having cool and tough monsters, but also cute ones that could still pack a punch. These sprites were made for the Game Boy a basically monochrome console with a screen of 160 by 144 pixels. And despite how people refer to how sprites were so much better back then, most of these guys look pretty tame. What's going on? So in 1996, the games were finally released in Japan. They weren't really covered by the media yet, but thanks to the related manga series published in the popular Koro Koro comic magazine, and a special Mew event unlocking Pokemon number 151, Pokemon Red and Green sold over a million units in 7 months. Now, not everyone might be familiar with Pokemon Red and Green, and rather know about Pokemon Red and Blue. Because as Game Freak grew during the success of Red and Green, they were getting new employees who were tasked to fix bugs and get this redo the sprite artwork. And this is where you get that freaky gold ban, a disappointed tentacle rule, and a big egg. It was an overhaul that was a special edition announced in the Koro Koro magazine, specifically stating that it's not a new game. But even that sold better than expected. Pokemon kept growing in Japan, expanding it to trading cards and an anime, and by the time they decided to go international in 1998, they were shipping out the games Pokemon Red and Blue, both with the updated graphics on the new Game Boy Color featuring 56 colors, allowing up to 4 colors per sprite. Well, 3 and a transparent color. Now we actually get to see what colors were more or less meant for these creatures. There's also Pokemon Yellow, which recontextualized the games to align with the anime, and whoop, every sprite was redrawn all over again. It's not as bad as it sounds, they only redrew the front sprite of each mon, and it's not like they're animated, and there's only 151 of them. So far. But Pokemania has just begun. How do you make a sequel to a smash hit? No one wants to fumble a potential series. 
Despite early surveys in North America not really liking Pokemon due to their cuteness over being cool, the new challenging gotta catch em all slogan and pushes towards anime dubs got those games and cards selling really well. Game Freak and Creatures Inc. wanted to capitalize on the success both in and outside of Japan and decided to roll out a sequel. Unlike some of the later installments, Pokemon Gold and Silver really felt like sequels in the traditional sense. As the story picks up after the events of the previous generation, and after you play through this game, you get to visit the previous game's area. While there were an addition of 100 new creatures, the old Pokemon were readily available in the wild. In fact, a few of the new monsters were direct evolutions from the original 151. But if Scyther could evolve this whole time, why couldn't I evolve it in the first game? While well, Pokemon always wanted to give an in-world explanation. You needed a metal coat, silly, and those coats can't be found in the first game. Interestingly, Pokemon will continue to come up with ways to justify these new evolutions instead of just saying that it evolves now, deal with it. But Pokemon didn't just make new evolutions, but also some pre-evolutions. As Pokemon's mix of cool and cute designs could be a reason of their widespread appeal, instead of only having radical new evolutions, there are also babies. One of the new game mechanics let people breed their own Pokemon to shuffle up stats and possibly make a stronger monster. Well, that monster will still be the same kind as her mother. But if you breed some specific mons, instead of looking exactly like their mom, they come out as new baby designs. While these were great for making plushies, they didn't have much of a use in the game. In fact, they slowed down the gameplay because instead of just leveling them up, most of the time you have to give them friendship points to evolve. But friendship didn't just let babies evolve. Eevee from Generation 1 can now evolve depending on getting enough friendship in the day or the nighttime, which is also a new feature of this game. Lastly, there are ways to reference the original set without being directly connected to the evolution line. Like Miltank being a counterpart to Tauros, and Heracross the Hercules Beetle rivaling Pinsir the Stag Beetle. So how did the sprites look in the game? Gold and Silver actually had different sprite work for the creatures, despite the roster being over 250 now. At the turn of the century, a special third version, Pokemon Crystal, was released where the sprites were briefly animated when entering battle. A lot of these sprites share similarities to the ones used in Gold and Silver, just with updated colors. So was this sequel a success? With the movies, anime, cards, and games, Pokemania peaked during this time, with Gold and Silver being the fastest selling games. But they eventually wouldn't sell more than the original. By 2002, the fad was over. Game Freak co-founder and Pokemon director Junichi Masuda, in an interview by Game Informer much later, recalled how he saw Pokemon merchandise disappear from USA stores. Quote, The next time I visited, it was all Star Wars. Everyone was saying Pokemon was on a downtrend. The fad's over. And I really felt that pressure to make something amazing. Nintendo had a shiny new toy on the block called the Game Boy Advance. Bigger screen, 32 bits instead of 8, and Pokemon had a chance to make a new game, Ruby and Sapphire. The Game Boy Advance allowed for a jump in sprites quality, going from squares of 56 pixels to squares of 64 pixels. So these new games don't need any prior knowledge. Just hop right into Hoenn with a completely separate story and map. By the way, Little Baby Me was invested in a franchise before this third gen was being revealed. I still remember my class huddling around one of the computers to check Cerebi.net to look at the new mons. Now while this batch of mons is definitely one of my favorites, this video is focusing on the original 151. And this generation had no additions to it. No new evolutions, just two new babies of Gen 2 Pokemon. Uh, I guess the Milotic line does mirror Gyarados very closely with a notion of a small fish having a big payoff. And while they're not new Pokemon, there were some graphical changes to Pikachu who is now thinner because the anime needed him to have a neck to make him emote more easily. Also, Arbok's hood pattern is different both here and in the last games, which was a cute reference to their dex entries. This would be the last generation they would do so before Pokemon just stuck to the Gen 1 pattern. But compared to how Gold and Silver approached making a sequel, Ruby and Sapphire was really starting something new. 
No more Team Rocket, no more going back to Kanto, just a new game with better combat mechanics. Until in two years when we were sent back to Kanto. Game Freak was planning Fire Red and Leaf Green during Ruby and Sapphire's development to make the new fans go back to the first Pokemon story, the one that sold the most overall. Fire Red and Leaf Green were retelling the first Pokemon story again, but this time with all the new Pokemon and battle mechanics. This might be one of the first cases where the first 151 got a special treatment because they got to have new sprites while all the other mons used the same sprites they had in Ruby Sapphire. I mean it does make sense because this game is all about rehashing Generation 1's story. But in another two years, similar to Pokemon Crystal, a special third version of Ruby and Sapphire was made with animated sprites and a little more story. But essentially another retelling. So, as a growing company trying to hold on to their initial boom, was branching out to new fans the right call? Or was it better to just do remakes of the same game? Well, even though the units sold aren't as high as the first set of games, together the efforts of this generation did sell more than the second gen. It was kinda working, but it needed all these parts. And all these remakes and third versions started some murmurs in the playground about how the games of this franchise kind of all feel the same. Nintendo had a new console right after Emerald was released in 2004. The Nintendo DS, featuring dual screens and wireless support. The next Pokemon games, Diamond and Pearl, wouldn't be released until 2006, with their third version, Platinum, also coming out two years later. A more powerful system allowed these next games to animate over 490 mons, and each sprite would use a larger area. This time, most of the sprites are identical in Platinum versus the other two. There are just some minor differences all across the board, not just in Gen 1. But what about the new monsters? Did they mostly ignore the previous Pokemon like in the last set of games? Quite the contrary. This generation made new evolutions their whole personality. Remember Magneton? Now they grow into Magnezone. Remember Tangela? Have a Tangrowth. Also now there's two more evolutions. They're Grass and Ice type. Hold up now. If Eevee can turn into Grass type, the Leaf Stone was a thing since Generation 1. Why couldn't I make a Leafeon before? Well, in this generation, Eevee could only achieve those forms when leveling up in a certain location in the game. This kind of sets up a precedent of these places needing to exist in future games, or else Leafeon and Glaceon can't be achieved. That's why by Generation 8, they actually retcon this and allow Eevee to evolve with Leaf Stone, or the yet-to-be-made Ice Stone. So yeah, new evolutions can be achieved through new specific items, learning a newly available move, or being in a new location. But that's not all. There are also a lot of pre-evolutions. So if a Generation 2 can justify that some Pokemon needed to be bred to achieve those babies, why did I never see a Munchlax when breeding Snorlax before? The enrolled reason was because you need another special item. These actually started in Generation 3, but basically you have to go out of your way and equip the parent with the correct incense to ever see these baby mons. Why would anyone do this? Pokemon expected this question, and they tried to make each incense have their own effects when held in battle. And I think babies can learn special moves. Was it a good enough reason? I don't know. But I do know that Pokemon mostly stopped making baby Pokemon after this. So this generation was supposed to tie up the past games through all these baby Pokemon and new evolutions. So out of all the references to older Pokemon, how much of them were from the original 151? Did they get special treatment? Out of the 107 new monster designs, 29 were cross-generational. And of those 29, 12 were from generation 1. The representation of the other previous gens were kind of fair. Much fairer than what we'll see in the future. Wait a minute. I almost forgot. Gen 4 started to flex on how much their art team can do, so they had a whole bunch of Pokemon, both old and new, feature sexual dimorphism. You know, like how some species of fiddler crabs have males with a single larger claw, or how some species of birds have different plumage patterns for males and females. Generation 4 gave minor changes to a lot of Pokemon, like shorter horns or different patterns. Sounds like a lot of effort for something most players wouldn't notice. As we did mostly stop making these extra forms in the future, unless the difference was clearly noticeable. And the number of sprites required for some mons essentially doubled. 
Before this generation closed out, we got another remake in the form of Heart Gold and Soul Silver, this time retelling Generation 2's story. These games were aimed at the fans from 7 years ago to come check out all these new mechanics and monsters on the Nintendo DS with another fresh batch of animated sprites. This seemed to have worked with critics being generally happy and the games outselling their last remake, Fire Red Leaf Green. Now personally, this was the generation that I started to hear the phrase, Pokemon is running out of ideas. Mostly reflecting on how so many of the new Pokemon were extensions of old ones. Also, the existence of a third better version down the road made many people just wait for that version to come out. It's been a whole decade since Pokemon was made, and the previous main audience are growing up. For new kids, this is one of the most complete experiences one can ask from Pokemon. But for someone like me though, this was when I stopped being interested. If Pokemon ran out of ideas, how are they still going to this People day? People have always said this and now there's over you a thousand! Be dum dum. It's because of Generation 5. Alright, I know that's a bold claim to make because, spoiler alert, this is the worst performing generation of the series. Black and white would sell less than Diamond and Pearl. Why? Was Pokemon too lazy? No, far from it. They're too bold. Welcome to Unova. For the first time, the map is no longer based off of their home country Japan, but to establish Pokemon as an international corporation, this next generation was based off the United States of America. While the map is more like New York City. This concept alone ensured a goal for Pokemon designs. Maybe Gen 5's roster isn't the most American looking, but from now on, a new game can be set in a geographical area with the monsters representing that area's culture, history, flora, and fauna. Now that's exciting! There's no new console from Nintendo this time around, and Pokemon knows that the previous fanbase is growing up, so they reasoned that they can make both older fans and new fans happy with a fresh new experience. I mean, Pokemon has always wanted to shake off this notion that all of their games are the same, so they put 3D models in their environment, added new battle modes, and most importantly, you can only play with the new 156 Pokemon for the main campaign. A lot of fans point out how this new batch of 156 mons have many parallels to the original 151. It's not a perfect fit, but 156 is the largest roster Pokemon would ever have, so it seems possible that they picked up some old concepts to make new designs. You got three stage muscular monsters evolving alongside rock creatures via trade. Both generations reference Bakus with sleep based tapirs, and there's a Pokeball mimic, just to name a few. Okay. So how were the original 151 treated this generation? They were erased! No more Pikachu, no more Charizard. Okay, that's an exaggeration. After the main story, you could access older Pokemon. In an interview with IGN, Masuda said this was because older players already knew too much about old Pokemon and what moves they should have. Now for these older Pokemon, most of them used the same sprites from their Gen 4 animations, but they were made smoother this time, with extra frames and the sprites keep moving during the battle. More notably, sprites were cut up to transform different body parts separately with similar animations for the sequel Black 2, White 2. While the sprites and animations have become more detailed over time, there's also a lot more monsters in the game now, with over 600 compared to the initial 151. So this technique was easier than hand drawing every frame. Black and White initially sold well, breaking records for the Nintendo DS but sales dropped off in a month. It's a shame, as Black and White might be one of the, relatively, the most mature storylines from the franchise, with a political campaign questioning the very core of the gameplay, asking if you deserve to use Pokemon if you just hurt them in battle, only for you to reveal how hypocritical they are. Pokemon really tried to make something different. Why didn't this game do better? Did kids really want to see old Pokemon that much? Now I personally wasn't invested in the franchise when all of this was going around, but that seemed to be the general consensus, with people being really mad not having their favorites and using those emotions to dunk on the new Pokemon they're forced to use instead. When the sequels rolled out in two years, older Pokemon were out in the wild from the get-go. 
Many consider this to be the last time Pokemon really cared about the story, because while Generation 5 really opened up the door for Pokemon to represent areas internationally, it also taught Game Freak a very dark lesson. The fans want Pikachu. Pokemon XY was released on the Nintendo 3DS, Nintendo's newest console that features stereoscopic imagery to make images pop out of the screens without the use of glasses by using a parallax barrier to aim light at your eyes separately. The French-inspired X and Y took this opportunity to make every Pokemon three-dimensional. This isn't the first time Pokemon went 3D, by the way. There are all sorts of spin-off series with 3D Pokemon, all the way back from 1998 with Hey You Pikachu by Umbrella, Pokemon Snap by HAL Laboratory, and even during later generations like the Colosseum series by Genius Sonority and Pokepark Games by Creatures Inc., just to name a few. Game Freak also showcased a 3D model in a cutscene back in black and white, but X and Y were the first games of the main series to have models of a uniform art style for every Pokemon. Now making 3D models out of over 700 Pokemon? Whew, that is a lot of work. But unlike the previous generations where sprites were drawn over and over again or new animations had to be made, these models would be future-proof. Just build them once and they should be good to go for future games. A lot of people to this day kind of lament the realism required for these 3D models compared to the past sprites, like Hitmon Top here, who's doing a cool radical spin on their head. But in 3D, they can't be spinning forever, so they only spin while attacking. Many also compare these to the very lively animations of the Stadium and Coliseum games. To be fair, Game Freak had to crunch making more than twice as many models than the Colosseum games did, and they were trying to make Pokemon feel consistent with Ken Sugimori style. It kind of reminds me of how the original red-green sprites only became more expressive when they had the chance to comb through every creature again. But these are also the models that were planned to be used repeatedly over the next years. In addition to the battle animations, X and Y had the Pokemon on Me feature, where you can pet and feed your stereoscopically 3D Pokemon. Yes, you could pet the dog. Oh snap, I didn't even talk about the new designs yet. There's a single new evolution in X and Y, which is Eevee's fairy type evolution, Sylveon. Not only did this fit well with the whole cute aesthetic of Pokemon on Me, but the dragon type needed a counter in the game. Adding a type this late into the franchise meant that many of the past creatures had to be redubbed to gain this fairy type. How did they explain this? Did they need a special item this whole time? No, they're just retconning old typings now. Fair enough. There are only 72 new Pokemon this time around, the smallest of any generation. With only one new evolution, how do you think the original 151 were treated? Here's a hint. Pikachu's cry is now their anime voice. But how else would you reference an old design other than giving it a new evolution or a pre-evolution? Pokemon really likes to adhere to this three-stage rule because any more could make the middle stages even more forgettable. Enter Mega Evolutions. Do you like Gengar? Now you could give it a marble and they could temporarily turn into a stronger beast in battle. After 30 megaforms in X and Y, Pulfer from Generation 1, more than a third of him, despite having 5 other generations to choose from. For all the babies who whined about not seeing their Charizard in Gen 5, this is what you wanted. This was when the notion of pandering to Gen 1 started, especially because Charizard and Mewtwo were the only ones to get not one but two megaforms. This is not the first game where a new gameplay gimmick was introduced, but it is the first game where it became a large marketing point with these new designs. Remember your beloved Charizard? Now they can become a real dragon type. In one year, what the heck, why are the games coming out so quickly, Pokemon made another remake this time of Generation 3 with Alpha Sapphire and Omega Ruby, bringing in 18 more Mega Evolutions and two special forms of the Legends. And these remakes made a lot of revisions to that generation story. Now our initial 151 are claiming 15 forms out of the 48. Looking back, I think Mega Evolutions are an exciting gimmick, visually, giving a strength boost and extra attention to Pokemon that really need them. Well, okay, it's also given to Pokemon that don't need them but are super popular, and the competitive balancing may be whack, but quite a few of these mods feel justified having this temporary fourth stage. 
but Pokemon was climbing back up, with this remake being one of the best-selling remakes yet. By 2016, Pokemon has become the highest grossing media franchise thanks to the games, cards, anime, merchandise. Things were looking up. The year is 2016. Pokemon has once again taken the world by storm, and this time, it's with a game. Not a mainline game, but through a mobile game. Pokemon Go by Niantic. The game uses augmented reality, which means it uses the camera to look at reality and put a CG image in front of it. But those dreams of finding Pokemon in real life are now realized. I personally didn't get into the Pokemon Go craze. I felt I was already too late to the hype. And as I said, I wasn't interested in Pokemon anymore. Especially not with the same 151 from Generation 1. Gosh darn it, can't they move on from their past? Little did I know, they already tried that in Generation 5. Why am I here anyways? Why am I talking about this franchise? Well, in college, I remember seeing this. There's the Alola Persian, <laughs> right? <laughs> I've seen this. <laughs> With the newfound attention of the franchise thanks to Pokemon Go being popular for all ages, Game Freak went all out in their ads for their next 3DS games, basically revealing half of their roster in those commercials. In the Hawaiian-based Pokemon Sun and Moon, Pokemon had one of their smartest innovations yet, regional forms. Take an old Pokemon and say that they evolved differently to better suit a new location. Most of these regionals are describing divergent evolution, not quite sure of the lore of a few of them later on. But, for the most part, yeah. They used to share the same species, but they adapted differently due to living in different environments. Now, all 18 regional forms in Alola were of Gen 1 Pokemon. Is Sun and Moon released within months since Pokemon Go? I don't know how much they anticipated how well Pokemon Go would do, but these forms mirrored how only Gen 1 Pokemon are over there. To be frank, it's not only these funny regional forms roping me back in, but it was mostly the new designs, from bee flies to meteorite to a whole school of fish. This is a really fun roster. And check this out, they have a Pikachu for people who are sick of them, with Mimikyu wearing a creepy edgy Pikachu costume, with the one in the anime having a vengeance against Pikachu. But I guess we're focusing on how the original 151 were treated over the years. And other than regional forms, there were Z moves. Instead of Mega Evolutions, the main gimmick here was that one Pokemon can hold and use a special crystal to do a funny dance and then launch a super attack or effect. These were easily possible because now every Pokemon has a model, just attach the model to an animation preset. But I'm not saying that it worked perfectly though. Everyone can use a Z crystal, but a few species got access to a custom one. The only ones who got one were either from this generation or from the original 151, with Pikachu getting two of them, plus the new Alolan Raichu getting one too. A year later, Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon would retread and ultimately wrap up our story of the Alola region. But we're not done. Nintendo released one of their most successful consoles, the Nintendo Switch in 2017. And a year later, Pokemon would release Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee, where they retell the first Pokemon story for the fifth time. This time is more in line with Pokemon Yellow's take, but now it has 3D models, Mega Evolutions, and even the Alolan forms. But only the first 151 Pokemon were allowed, and Pokemon Go's OC. I must say, though they've been using the same models since Generation 6, the Switch made them look quite nice. The art direction kinda peaked in Let's Go, and gosh dang, that's gonna be a contentious topic soon. Expectations are high for the highest grossing media franchise. I mean, rightfully so. Before the UK-inspired Pokemon Sword and Shield came out, it was met with a lot of controversy. In an interview during the Nintendo Treehouse event, Junichi Masuda said that players couldn't bring in past Pokemon species that can't be caught in Sword and Shield. Now so far, even in Generation 5, players can eventually bring in any past Pokemon, so why the cut? Masuda said models needed to be updated and new animations had to be made. Especially due to the new Dynamax mechanic where every Pokemon can blow up into a Kaiju. So keeping the 800 plus Pokemon in the game 
apparently wasn't feasible. The fans called this cut Dexit, as fans were really not happy about this decision. In fact, this led to people further scrutinizing every corner cut by the highest grossing media franchise. Isn't Dynamax just scaling the model up? Yo, these models are identical to the ones in X and Y. What animations? Even the human animations oh, are the same. Oh brother, this tree stinks! But weirdly, I've also seen how the Pokemon fandom reacts to any pushback, with some fans complaining about how others can never be happy, or trying to defend that the cut is because of competitive reasons, even though the most popular competitive Pokemon still eventually show up. Some complaints are valid. But you want my two cents on the matter? It is true that they needed new models, or at least new textures for the Dynamax mechanic, because just scaling the model up make lines look off. But most players couldn't notice that extra work, as most of the Pokemon outside of that form are still using the old models. Dexa would become much more justified in future games when the models become radically different. It was a very emotional time, with a lot of calls to boycott the game. So how did it do? Second most sold Pokemon game of all time, baby! Just behind the initial generation's boom during Pokemania. So how is the first 151 treated? Kinda handsomely if you ignore the fact that more than a fifth of them aren't in the game at all. Dynamax was this generation's gimmick, which is available to nearly all Pokemon. But some get a special Gigantamax form, which gives them a new design. All but two of the Pokemon that received the Gigantamax form were either from Generation 8 or Generation 1. If I include the additional DLCs that came out in the following years, that's right, Pokemon is now doing DLCs instead of having a special third version or sequels. 12 out of 32 Gigantamax forms are of Generation 1 Pokemon. Another Charizard form. This is what the people wanted. I almost forgot. Remember the ingenious regional idea from Sun and Moon? This game has them too. Out of the 19 regional forms, 11 of them are from the original 151. In this generation, some regional forms even have their own evolution, instead of following the older Pokemon's line. For example, Galarian Meowth evolves into Perserker, who looks very different from Persian. Also, the legendary bursts from Generation 1 got regional forms? That's pretty cool. So before this generation ended, Pokemon had something big up in store. But before that, they remade Diamond and Pearl. Ooh, people were not happy about this little game. Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl by Ilka Studio was a translation of the original Diamond and Pearl games to the Switch. I mean, they had to make it from the ground up on Unity, but unlike the other remakes, which added new chapters, brought in new Pokemon, or allowed Mega Evolutions and different forms, this was pretty much a straight playthrough of Diamond and Pearl's story, with small additions like harder NPC battles and having a fairy type. These games were mostly for reminding people about Generation 4's story, as the big game coming up was actually Legends Arceus, set in the location of Generation 4, but in the past. People were very excited about this game. Gamers sure loved their dodge rolls. And yeah, here we go. Every Pokemon now has a new model, with dimple dyes instead of sticker textures. As this game has a direct connection to Generation 4, every Generation 4 Pokemon is here, including related mons. But out of the original 151, only 48 made it in. How bold. In fact, they also left behind Charizard. And players still love this game for the refreshing catching mechanic and action boss battles. Now this game also had the regionals and regional evolutions with four out of the 16 regionals referencing Gen 1. Additionally, Scyther would get a new evolution called Cleavor. All right, in terms of looking at the original 151, I think we're finally done with this generation. Good thing nothing else is controversial anymore. Right? Fresh off the heels of Legends Arceus, people were willing to give Scarlet and Violet a shot. But the Spain-inspired Paldea was riddled with clipping issues, frame drops, and other bugs and glitches that haven't been patched to this day. This game came out in the same year as Legends Arceus. Players have been saying that Pokemon needs to slow down, as their rush development cycle is negatively impacting the quality of the games. 
Many people came out to say how embarrassing it is to have this game be sold at full price. However, Scarlet and Violet would go on to receive the best sales award at the Japan Game Awards. Yep, it even sold more than Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. People really don't vote with their wallets. But let's focus on Scarlet and Violet. Every single Pokemon in the game got a new model again? Dang, they're really not trying to use these models in the future, are they? See, this makes Dexit make a little more sense. Though, I don't know if I personally agree with their current art direction. It kind of looks like they're trying to go for a more realistic style. You know, more like PUBG rather than Fortnite. This is evident in the lighting of the metal Pokemon being very shiny. And also the fur being much less saturated now. I don't know. Some people really like this. Some don't. People have their preferences. So there are only two regional forms in Paldea. One of Tauros and the other of Generation 2's Wooper who grows into Clotsire. Oh my gosh, look at him. But Gen 9 introduced something different as well. The base game had two new lines that clearly resembled Diglett and Tentacool, called Wiglet and Toad School, respectively. I made videos on them before, but I want to clarify something. Many fans have called these Convergent Pokemon, despite Pokemon never giving them a proper term. But I previously emphasized that these Pokemon in their in-world lore are not directly related to each other, despite looking similar, as they coincidentally ended up with similar bodies. Alright, time to bring out the grown-up pants. As comments have pointed out, convergent evolution in our world isn't a mere coincidence. Convergent species found those similar structures because those shapes do well for them in their environments. Some people want to call these lookalikes other than Convergence, which works as well, but look at how they describe the latest Convergent, Poltergeist. Though ecologically similar to Sinistee, it's a completely different Pokemon. It really sounds like they're going for the definition of Convergent Evolution, as these Pokemon develop similar body shapes due to ecological niches. So far, the associations have been between a mole and an eel, Mana War and a Mushroom, and a Cup of Tea, and a Caddy of Tea Powder. That last one confuses some Pokemon fans. But that sounds like a topic for another video. Let's see... Oh! New evolutions are back! No more new babies, but out of the four new evolutions, Primate gets one by being so angry that they die and become annihilate. Very sad. Please keep your blood pressure in check. Lastly, there's a set called Paradox Pokemon, which we don't know the complete lore on yet, but they are dino-themed and robot versions of various past Pokemon in Scarlet and Violet, respectively. In terms of the original 151, surprisingly, none of the Violet Paradoxes reference the original roster, but Scarlet has Paradox Jigglypuff and Magneton. Hey, who does for the more even representation of past generations? I kinda wish fans as a whole can feel the same too. That initial massive Pokemania boom planted the first 151 designs into so many childhoods, and Pokemon has found it profitable to continue referencing them. But as with many things, it's all a balance. Referencing familiar stuff, but also providing fresh new experiences. Finally, after decades of games, they're rivaling the number of sales from that first boom, affecting so many other lives. Hey, by the way, hang around if you want to see a cool graphic I made with all these emojis I painfully drew for the video. But if you like my stuff, I have a series here talking about my independent STEM-based creature collector, Stemma, where I'm trying to make my own beginnings. Pokemon started with 151, Temtem has 164. And I currently revealed around 75 on my channel so far, but there's gonna be a lot more. So subscribe and follow my journey as I'll have other video essays like this in the future. Either way, thank you so much for watching my longest video as of yet, and especially thank you to my subscribers and Patreon members for being patient with me. I really wanted to review Pokemon's history in a more relevant angle to see what I could learn for myself. Alright, thank you all so much for watching, now roll the time lapse! Let's see who changed the most out of the original 151. Drawing all of these were quite a pain, but at least we're finally here. Generation 1, Evolutions. Generation 2, Gold and Silver, New Pre-Evolutions. Babies discovered through breeding. New Evolutions.
including Hitmontop here, which technically isn't a new evolution of a Gen 1 Mon, but a new evolution of a Gen 1 Mon's baby. Generation 3. There were no direct additions to any of the original families. Generation 4. Diamond and Pearl. New pre-evolutions. These required an incense. New evolutions. These required various other methods. Generation 5. Trying to reason or force some parallels could lead to whole wars, so I'm going to avoid doing so. Generation 6. X and Y. New evolution. Just Sylveon. Mega evolutions. I'm also including the Pokemon in the same family of a Gen 1 Mon, like Caesar. Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire. Mega evolutions. Generation 7. Sun and Moon. Regional forms. I'll temporarily show who got custom Z crystals, but I won't keep these images on the board because those didn't change the design. Generation 8. Sword and Shield. Regional forms. New regional evolutions. Gigantamax forms. Isle of Armor DLC for Sword and Shield. Regional forms. Gigantamax forms. The Crown Tundra DLC for Sword and Shield. Regional forms. Legends Arceus. Regional forms. New evolution. For Generation 1, just Cleavor. Generation 9, Scarlet and Violet. Regional form. Just Tauros, but there's three forms of Paldean Tauros. New evolution. For Gen 1 Mons, just Annihilate. Convergent Species. Although they are not related in their world, the designs are a clear reference. Paradox Pokemon. Same goes. For the record, the Teal Mask DLC for Scarlet and Violet didn't change any of the Gen 1 Mons. So with that, thank you for watching.